Welcome back, everybody. If you're new, my name is Nicholas, and this is Investing Against the Grain. In today's episode, we're going to talk about problematic issues that we see with Volkswagen and Ford. Okay, now a lot of you already know things going on right now with Ford and Herbert Dees, so I won't prolong that, but I want to highlight some some potential issues that I see with Ford, especially around the Mustang brand. So I don't want everybody to think that what's happening with Volkswagen means that they're the only ones with problems. I want to highlight something that I've talked about a lot over the course of the year that I've had this podcast, this uh, YouTube channel. And so I just want to bring attention yet again to the issues that I see with Ford. Okay, so uh, we're going to focus on that. We're going to talk about some other things. And I have a very, very exciting, uh, let's say, tweet to show you guys regarding FSD beta 10.13. And I think this could be very, very bullish for the stock, for FSD progress, and just for general life as, as we know it. So with that said, do me a favor. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. Let's get into it. Okay, so for those of you who are new to the channel, you may not know that I used to be a Mustang owner. Okay, I used to own a uh, a a four five zero excuse me five zero liter V eight manual drive uh, Mustang GT. Okay, I loved it. It was a great car. It was a lot of fun. Was it efficient? No. Was it a gas guzzler? Yes. Was it expensive? Yes. Could it fit four people even though it had four seats? No. All right. The back seats were essentially useless unless it was like a very little kid or maybe if you had a small dog, but it was really just there for, I don't know, just to be there. It was honestly kind of a waste of space. So I do have a affinity towards, towards the Mustang brand because you know, I have sentimental value towards the brand. It was the first vehicle I ever owned, the first vehicle I ever spent my money on. It's the first vehicle, uh, you know, that really allowed me to do a lot of things, get from point A to point B, uh, from jobs to, you know, dates and relationships, you know, just it, it allowed me a sense of autonomy with my life, okay? So I have nothing against Ford. I have nothing against uh, Mustang brand. Now, with that said, I also have a lot of respect for Ford because they are trying very hard to pivot. So I want to—I don't want this this episode to come off as me bashing Ford at all, all right, or Volkswagen in a little bit here. But instead, I just want to bring some context to everybody's perspective and show the juxtaposition between Ford, Volkswagen, and Tesla. Because at the end of the day. We always hear these these naysayers about Tesla saying, well, here comes the competition, here comes Ford, here comes Volkswagen, but I think it's important to put a pause on some of this. So let's get into some details. So first thing I want to talk about is what we see right here. So what you see here is a post from Jim Farley the same day that Tesla had their earnings. In fact, this was, I think, posted just after Tesla released their earnings. So what is it? So this is just an ad saying that Ford is saying that they will have 600,000 EV production run rate uh, by 2023, by late 2023. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, expected run rate by late 2023. 20, uh, and so the mix is 270,000 Mustang mach 150,000 Transit EVs, 150,000 F-150 Lightnings, and then 30,000 midsize uh, SUVs. And again, if you notice, we have North America, Europe, and China for the Mustang Mach-E. We have North America and Europe for the Transit, North America for the F-150, and then Europe for the midsize, mid-size SUV. So, you know, just taking a step back, you see this like, hey, great. But I thought it was very interesting that Jim Farley decided to post this the day of Tesla earnings. Was this a nice move from a marketing perspective? Sure, it probably was. It was a day where Tesla got a lot of news and it was all about Tesla and Jim tried to take the spotlight a little bit away from it. After all, don't forget, every time EVs are mentioned, Tesla's gonna get brought in. Anytime anything's mentioned, it's gonna be Tesla and Elon Musk. And so they essentially get this free publicity. And it really seems like Jim Farley was trying to piggyback off of a Elon Musk Tesla type behavior. So. So, okay, so this is all well and good, I suppose. First thing I wanna bring to everyone's attention, what this says is production run rate of 600,000 EVs, all right? According to Tesla, Tesla currently has a production run rate of possibly 
a little over 2 million, okay? Or maybe just at 2 million. And while I'm at it, let me correct something I said yesterday. Yesterday, I was doing some quick math in my head when I was doing my my uh, my this, uh, my episode. As you all know, a lot. this is all, not a lot, this is all live stream. I don't script any of this. I just speak to you guys, you know, from what's on top of my mind. And I made a mistake when it came to the math. So I was, <laughs> this, this was really bad, actually. I had mentioned that uh, Elon had said that they plan to get to 40,000 vehicles per week. And for some reason, when I, after I said that, I decided to say 40,000 vehicles per month. And then I came up to a math of 2.1 million. Clearly, you guys know what I meant. But I figured, hey, let's be accurate. Let's come back. Let's fix our mistakes. Let's iterate. Let's get better. So apologies for that. Anyways, getting back to this. So Tesla has this stated essentially, well, I don't even think Tesla said it, but they have the capacity, according to the earnings report, to do 750,000 out of Shanghai, to do, I think, 550 out of Fremont, and then uh, 250 out of Berlin and Austin. So you can add that up, do your own math, okay? Now, Elon also said that they plan to be at 40,000 vehicles per week by the end of 2022, saying that they've also been able to do 30,000 vehicles per week multiple times uh, throughout the year. So when we see 600,000 EVs here production run rate, that doesn't mean they'll be producing 600,000 vehicles. That matters. That context matters. So when we see all these numbers, sure, this sounds nice and good, but how accurate is it? And on that same note, where will Tesla be by the end of 2023? Well, we plan on a 50% compound annual growth rate, right? So CAGR when it comes to Tesla. So this year, we anticipate them to be about, say, 1.4 million vehicles, right? And that's despite the Shanghai lockdowns, which probably cost them about 100,000 vehicles. Okay, so if we plan 1.4 million for this year, well, what's 50% of that? Well, that's another 700,000. Okay, so that's 2.1 million vehicles to be delivered by the end of 2023. But here's the question. What will Tesla's run rate be by the end of 2023? Well, if they are going to grow 50% year over year, you would anticipate they would be somewhere near 3 million vehicle run rate by the end of 2023. Maybe they won't be exactly at 3 million because I'm sure some of that ramp up will happen during the course of 2023. But the point is they plan on delivering 3 million vehicles by 2024 or in 2024. So again, this year, 2022, 1.4 million vehicles. You add 700,000 on top of that for 50% compound annual growth rate. That puts you at 2.1 million. 50% of 2.1 million, just call it a million, right? That puts you at 3 million for 2024, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is they are drastically far behind Tesla, not even close. Okay, so let's dive a little deeper into this. Now, as far as we know, really the only electric vehicle sales that we see from Ford for the most part at the moment, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong about this because I really don't know much about the Transit EV, but I do know about the Mustang Mach-E and I do know about the Ford F-150 Lightning. So those are really the main two vehicles they're selling right now. So let's take a look at the Mustang Mach-E. I have no doubt that Ford will be able to sell every F-150 Lightning that they, they make, but we'll touch on that in one second. Let's start with the Mustang. Well, first of all, I want to give you a little history about the Mustang. Okay, so take a look at this, this chart here. So you're going to have to trust me. If not, you can look it up yourself. Uh, you know, and you should always not trust what I say. Verify what I say. Do your own due diligence. But here we can see um, from 2015 to 2020, the, the total sales of, of uh, Mustang, the Mustang brand uh, Ford, for Ford. All right, so you see in 2015, 122,000 vehicles. All right. I guess that's okay. Not that many. 2016, 105,000. 2017, 81,000. 2018, 75. 19, 72. And 2020, 61,000 vehicles. You notice anything interesting there? Essentially, over a five course year, they have lost 50% of their deliveries. Okay, so that's interesting. Well, let's, let's take a look at what Ford is doing with the Mustang Mach-E. Surely that's different. It's an EV everybody has or everybody wants evs right you you make it they will buy it okay right well let's take a look at that 
Well, here we can see Ford Mustang Mach-E sales in the US, all right? Ar arguably the best market for them right now when it comes to making the Mustang Mach-E. Well, here we can see essentially uh, an entire, call it one year, almost year and a half, call it year and a quarter, let's be conservative here, of, of producing and selling the Mustang Mach-E. The best month that they have had was April of 2022, and they only sold about 4,000 vehicles. Now, keep in mind, the previous best was in February. And you can see what this chart looks like, right? So you can make your own conclusions here. The reason I bring this up is because in about a year, call it a year and a quarter, year and a half, they have not been able to ramp this up. Meanwhile, Tesla at a Giga Berlin, they're already doing a thousand Model Ys per week. And the factory has been open for less than a quarter, less than a quarter. And they're already doing a thousand a week. Okay. So more than a thousand weeks, shoot, had, had, a, had a brain fart there. So already they are doing 4,000 per month. And this is the best that Ford has come out with thus far. This spells problem to me. Either people aren't interested in Ford. People are definitely not interested in Mustang brands we've seen here before. Or there's something going on, okay? And, and it could just be that people prefer Teslas. People prefer to spend that money on a Model Y, on a Model 3, rather than on a Ford Mustang Mach-E. This is a real thing, okay? It's no different than when other companies try to come out with a smartphone and people said, no, I'd rather spend a little more money and get an iPhone. I want, if I'm going to spend this kind of money, I'm going to get an electric vehicle. Why wouldn't I get the best? Especially if it's pretty attainable. It's not that far for me. Okay. So that is where we stand with the Mustang brand. Now, again, highly, highly, uh, you know, highly proud of Ford and what they're trying to do and their initiative, you know, but I think that there's levels to this and we need to have context. All right, not everybody's going to be a Tesla. We are going to see contraction in the market, and it's important to highlight this. Now, we also know, and this isn't, again, to berate Ford, but Jim Farley not too long ago said that they were no longer profitable with the Mustang Mach-E. This is a problem again. This shows you that it doesn't matter just about deliveries. Okay, that is just superficial what we're looking at. It also matters about profitability. That is a big deal. So when everybody was giving Tesla all this kind of crap about they're not doing anything, they're going to go bankrupt, all that stuff. And meanwhile, Tesla was just head down year over year, year over year, reinvesting back into the business, reinvesting back into the business, taking things in vertically or in-house to go to have vertical integration. Everybody was chastising them. But this is the difference. Now Tesla has about 30% gross margins, auto gross margins. Forget about this last quarter. There's a lot of weird math going on there. But even if you said that, okay, 26, 26%, 26.9%, call it 27% auto gross margins. Well, that is very profitable. Mustang Mach-E is not even profitable yet after a year and a quarter. Okay, so, so this is what we're talking about. This is why it's so different. Again, Berlin already exceeding essentially or matching what it took Ford a year, a year and a quarter to do. And Tesla did in less than a quarter. Tesla is at the same time doing that at a 27% gross margin or auto gross margin if you want to be conservative. There's levels to this. It matters. Okay. So with that said, let's transition over to issues with Volkswagen. Well, the most notable, which you all must have seen at some point today, Volkswagen CEO Herbert Dees is stepping down. Okay, so I read a lot of articles today, and the ones I really focused on were the German articles because I thought they would hold, I thought they would hold the most accuracy or understanding the climate of what's going on with Volkswagen. So don't so take that with a grain of salt. But what I what I read a lot from the U.S. articles was that this was a amicable uh, uh, transition or separating of ways between Dies and Volkswagen. Well, I call BS on that. And the reason I call BS on that is because we have known for the last, call it 18 months, that Herbert Deese has been threatened or on thin ice to essentially get let go and, and you know, be taken over. And now we see this happen. All right. So it's not like this came out of left field. We all kind of saw this coming. 
we all knew that this you know, all the rumors and everything circulating articles that there was friction and contention between volkswagen the things they were doing and herbert deese herbert deese was very strict he knew what had to be done to get the team going in a certain direction and you know he did his best and sure volkswagen is doing decent i guess uh but there's a long way to go so what i read from the german articles was kind of telling what they highlighted wasn't that it was an amicable separation but what they highlighted was that apparently the group volkswagen did not like the tone of which herbert deese spoke to all of the employees right essentially in my opinion being honest right it, he mentioned that you know if we don't step it up there's gonna be a lot of layoffs that we need to we need to improve our manufacturing process to keep up with Tesla. He was very blunt. He was very direct. He even talked about getting away from dealership models, right? All this stuff. And yeah, a lot of people didn't like that. You know who really didn't like that? The unions. The unions really rebelled against, against this type of speak and this type of attitude. And so according to these German articles, the, the new CEO coming in from Porsche, that he will have a more team building spirit building atmosphere for the company well you know that's all good and well but when you're not doing well when you're not winning there is no team building or spirit okay you really need to do what you need to do to get the company going and i think herbert these had the right mentality to trim the fat even look at Elon. Elon recently announced layoffs for the company for their salaried employees, saying that they got too top-heavy when it came to that portion, but they need to focus more on hiring hourly employees. In other words, the people that build the cars, the people that do hands-on work. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this. I think this was a... I think this, is, this will be interesting. I'm not going to say that Volkswagen can't pivot in the right direction with this, but I think this is perhaps perhaps a blow to volkswagen but we'll see how this pans out and then you know there's also the other drama with the whole um i forget what's called carad software essentially it's supposed to be this unified software that would essentially um you know uh go across all segments within the volkswagen brand so so bmw porsche Vo volkswagen you know and the software was supposed to be a ubiquitous um interface and platform that they could leverage across all the vehicles and that has just gone awry all right i think what a lot of these companies are learning ford volkswagen gm uh you know fiat chrysler slantis i think they're all learning software's hard and you can't just pull it out of thin air you can't have a third party doing it you have to do it in-house at least at least if you want to be in the same conversation or the likes of a tesla all right, so we talked, talked about Volkswagen. We talked about uh, Ford. I just want to touch on one last thing regarding Germany, and that is Giga Berlin. Giga Berlin supposedly is already completed with the retooling of the Model Y line. We're also hearing that they've already t they're starting to test doing front and rear Giga castings with structural battery pack of 4680 batteries. We're also hearing that they're starting with new paint options and white interior trim for the vehicles. Now, this doesn't mean that any of this is going to go into ramp. This doesn't mean any of this is already going live, but it shows that they're testing it probably so that they can go ahead and start doing it eventually. And as far as the 4680 structural pack, well, apparently that was shipped over from Texas. Again, the only reason I highlight this is because of the efficiency of Berlin, the efficiency of Tesla back up and running. This is bullish. I'm also hearing, and don't quote me on this because I don't know how true this rumor is, that this retooling will not mean that they'll have three, shift ju three shifts just yet. They're going to wait until later on into the fall to add three shifts. Without three shifts, it means they're not going 24-7. So apparently in the fall is when they'll ramp up to three shifts. But we'll see. And you know, if anything changes on that, I'll let you know. All right. Now, I mentioned something really bullish. I mentioned something bullish about full self-driving. Well, take a look at this. So I retweeted from Chuck Cook. Uh, I wrote, once again, bullish at Greg Proctor. That's uh, my best friend. You should follow him if you're interested. Uh, he's an intellectual property attorney, really good guy. I had him on the channel once. I'll probably have him back on soon to talk about some Twitter drama with Elon. But anyways, I said, 
Um, once again, bullish. Uh, they will not let this release go live without Chazman's unprotected left salt. At least this is my hope. And so here we can see uh, Chuck Cook tweeting, my wife just took this picture a few minutes ago, so the, so the ADAS drivers are testing again. I went to say hi, and as the car approached on its next attempt, they saw me immediately and turned away. I guess they have uh, instructions not to identify themselves. Hashtag FSD beta, Elon Musk. Okay, so, so what is this? What are we looking at? Okay, this is Chuck's unprotected left-hand turn. If you don't know what it is, just go to his channel. Check it out. It is arguably one of the hardest problems that Tesla is trying to overcome right now with the FSD beta. It's a very difficult uh, interaction where you have to navigate median, very fast traffic. You have to understand velocity and the rate that you have to accelerate in relation to the velocity and acceleration of those other vehicles. You have to be able to negotiate a median at a weird angle. You can't really see everything. I mean, there's a lot going on with it. And so according to release notes for 10.13, um, FSD beta 10.13 will solve Chuck's unprotected left-hand turn. So my premise is that Tesla, Elon, will not allow this release to go out just so that Chuck can go make a YouTube video and say, ah, uh, yeah, this isn't solved. I don't know what's going on. It's not good yet. I think that they are wanting to have this. Look, what would be a better publicity moment? Then for Chuck Cook to make a video showing FSD beta doing it flawlessly over and over and over and over again. That would be great. That would definitely boost up FSD beta sales. And I think that would give more confidence to the direction of FSD beta. So for me, this is highly bullish. This is highly bullish for Tesla. This is highly bullish for FSD beta. This is very bullish for Chuck Cook. It's very bullish for Tesla stock. And it's very bullish for autonomy and for our lives in general, because this is yet another step towards us changing the paradigm of our worlds and the way we live our lives with the possibility of autonomous vehicles. So I'm very excited. I'm very bullish. Um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it, this is awesome. I can't wait to get it. I can't wait to test it. I'll be testing uh, unprotected left that I have here in the Tampa Bay area. And I live in downtown St. Petersburg. We've got a lot of very dangerous unprotected left-hand turns that I'll be very excited to test this out on. All right, we're gonna leave it there. I hope you guys enjoy your weekend. If anything comes up, I'll probably make a video this weekend. Um, I kind of don't have a lot to going on this weekend, which is the first time in quite some time. So I'm pretty excited about that. And so maybe I can devote more time towards making content for all of you. All right. If you enjoy this type of content, if you found any value of this and you want to share it with other people, it's very easy. All you have to do is hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, or ring that bell. I love you all. Enjoy your weekend. Be safe out there. Have fun with your family. Have fun with your friends. Go unwind. Peace.